But what I'm going to do tonight largely is share data with you from the Canadian Baby Sib study. And it's a study that's been running for about 10 years now. And what we're doing is following babies who have a brother or sister with autism because we know those babies are at increased risk for autism. I mean, we know their risk for autism is higher than risk is among babies who don't have uh, a brother or sister with autism. And so I want to share those data with you. Um, so let me just tell you what the main goals of the study are. Um, the main goals are to identify the earliest signs of autism. So we know that these babies are at increased risk. We're studying them because what we want to do, we know that a higher percentage of them have autism, and what we want to map out are the very earliest signs so that ultimately we can educate people about the earliest signs and hopefully start detecting autism earlier than is currently the case. You probably know that things are better, but still what studies show is that there's still a lot of children who aren't being um, identified with autism or diagnosed with autism still until three and a half or four years of age. And what we'd like to do is move that down and ideally identify and diagnose more children by two, ideally, so that we can start intervening with children earlier. So one of the main purposes of the study is to identify the earliest signs. The other thing we need data on, we need data on what the risk is of having a child with autism once you've had one child with autism. And we don't have data, good data on that right now. Um, the data are really theoretically derived. They're not based on good scientific evidence. Um, and in fact, they're really based on old, old prevalence data where we thought autism was much rarer than it really is. So we need good data on what the probability is of having a second child once you've had one child with autism. And as you can imagine, we need really large numbers to be able to provide good data on that. And finally, um, the final purpose is that we want to start developing and evaluating very, very early intervention for children with autism. So as you'll see as I speak, we are picking up children as young as 12, certainly by 18 months, and so now what we're really confronted with is the need to design interventions that are going to help these children who have strong, strong signs of autism. So let me just tell you a bit about the study. The study is going on in Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Kids, and that's actually where I started the study at Sick Kids in Toronto. It's also going on in Edmonton now and in Halifax. We also have data from Hamilton, Ontario, McMaster University, um, but now it's going on in these three main sites. Now, there's two groups of children. There's babies who have a brother or sister with autism, and of course, they constitute the main group of interest to us. But then we have a control group of babies, and they're babies that don't have a brother and sister and don't have any immediate family history of autism in the family. And the babies are seen at regular intervals, starting at six months of age. We're actually funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, so we're funded by um, the feds. And, um, we're funded to see the babies at 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 24 months of age. And then we see them at three years of age and do a gold, what we call a gold standard diagnostic assessment. And that's done blind to all the previous information. 
So the person that does that three-year assessment doesn't know, has, has no information about that baby earlier on that we've gathered in the study because we're trying to emulate what it would be like if parents took their child to a clinician and didn't have the detailed information we have about their early history. And then we see the children once more at five years of age. And the reason is that there still are a few children at three years of age that we're not absolutely sure about. Plus, we want to confirm that the diagnosis we gave at three years of age is in fact valid. That is, that the child still would meet full criteria for autism or autistic spectrum disorder at five years of age as well. When we started this study 10 years ago, there was no way, there was no method for monitoring and detecting very early signs of autism. So we developed a scale we call the Autism Observation Scale for Infants. And this is a, it's, a, it's really a direct observational measure. So there's a little play session with a baby. And the session takes about 20 minutes. And what we do is press for the kinds of behaviors that are diagnostic of autism. You know, so for example, well, I'll actually show you some examples. Anyway, the items that we've included on this scale that we actually press for really come from a variety of sources. Um, they come from parents, reports, parents who have children with autism. They've told us about what their children were like when they were very young, so we use that information. There's also home videos of children who were later diagnosed with autism, but people have the videos of them earlier on, so those have been analyzed for behaviors. And there's a few case reports. And then there's a whole group of us that are working on this, and most of us have been in the field of autism for years. So we just drew on all sources of information we could when we designed this scale. So, and I'll show you some examples in a minute, but it's really a um, four-point scale. Either, either a child, you know, doesn't have any difficulty showing the behaviors that we're interested in, or they have a little difficulty, or they have a lot of difficulty showing them. So ratings are given depending on the likelihood of the child showing the behavior. Now these are just sample behaviors that we look at in this little play session. So visual tracking is just the ability, you know, if the baby's sitting here and someone's sitting across from the baby, they'll take an object and move it right along the horizontal dimension and see if the baby can track the object. Um, social smiling, that's will the baby smile when you smile at them? And you know, what's interesting here is we know some babies will smile when they're playing with a toy, but it's hard to get them to smile socially, to actually smile in response to your smile. Social anticipation is peekaboo. So you're playing peekaboo, and after you've done it a few times, and you know, the blanket's up, and you say, peekaboo, will the baby anticipate? Um, that you're going to pull the blanket down and show your face. And usually what babies will do is lean up or pull the blanket down. And we're also looking there at whether the baby has pleasure in that kind of game. Eye contact, responsiveness to change in facial emotion. This is actually a really good item. So you're smiling at the baby, and all of a sudden you make your face neutral. And the question is, you know, does the baby respond to that? Typically, if you're smiling at a baby and all of a sudden you go neutral, you know, babies don't like it and they'll either turn away or they'll try and get you to smile again. Orientation to name, that just means when you call the baby's name, will the baby look at you? So say if, you know, the baby's right there just beside me playing with the toy and I call his or her name, 
will he look or she look? Imitation, you know what that is. I mean, if you take a stick and tap it and give it to the baby, will the baby copy or imitate what you're doing? Coordination of action and eye gaze. So does the child look at what they're doing? So if they're playing with a toy, do they look? Or do they just carry things around and manipulate things without looking at them? Reactivity refers to whether the ba baby's overreactive, that is, do they get startled at a lot of things like sounds or touches, or are they underreactive? Is it hard to sort of engage the baby? Um, do they tend to sort of be just sit and not react to things happening. And then we're also looking for atypical motor behaviors, and we're looking for a range of things. I mean, you probably know some of the classic behaviors are flapping or flicking fingers and peripheral vision. With really young babies, though, we don't see so much of that. We'll actually see odd postures, or we'll see babies who move themselves in odd, pardon me, with movements that are rather unusual, like just the way they might move along the floor. Um, and atypical sensory behaviors. I mean, here, one of the major ones is visual fixation. Babies who, for example, will fixate on a light for a long period of time. Like parents will say, oh, my baby, is so good, it's like he's too good. You know, my 12-month-old, I can sit him on the floor and he'll just sit there for an hour or an hour and a half while I do the housework. Well, that's not typical of most 12-month-olds. And the kind of thing you, that you'll often find out is if you ask more questions, the baby has seen something like a light on the ceiling and the baby is staring at it for very long periods of time. One of the babies we saw, we couldn't figure out what she was staring at. But finally we figured out anything that was a circle. So she'd stare at doorknobs, she'd stare at buttons. She was obviously fascinated with perfect symmetry. Okay, now I just want to, I just want to present some more data to you about the babies. We followed 316 babies now. The high-risk babies are the babies who have a brother or sister with autism, and 118 low-risk babies. But not all of them have been followed to 36 months. And I just want to remind you that 36 months is a critical time for us because we don't really know. Well, the babies haven't been formally diagnosed until 36 months. Now, I will tell you, if we're really worried about a baby, we will diagnose them earlier, because obviously we want the babies to get into treatment. Um, but the formal diagnosis happens um, for all of them at 36 months. Now, so 188 babies have been, almost 200 have been followed to 36 months, and almost 100 of the low-risk controls. And you'll note that at 36 months, now I've got 27 to 45 meet criteria, full criteria for autism or ASD. And the reason we have that band is we have diagnosed 45. But if we were really, really conservative in our diagnoses, 27 of them meet very conservative criteria. So 15 to 20 percent of our babies are diagnosed with ASD, okay? Which is much higher than we thought. When we started this out, people were saying that you had a 4 to 8 percent chance of having a child with autism if you already had a child with autism whereas our data are showing that it's more like, you know, at least 15% and possibly as high as 20%. Now, we were the first people to start this research, and there's now about five or six teams throughout the world who are following babies. So very soon, others are going to have data as well, and we'll be able to look at whether 
you know, their findings are the same as ours. I can tell you that it looks as if others are starting to replicate what we're finding. So obviously one of the messages is the risk of having a child with autism after families have one child is higher than we thought. But there's a very important message for all of you. These are average data. What we can't, what we don't know is what the risk is for individual families. Because this is the average, like on average, there's a 15% 15, 15 chance. But in your particular family, the risk may be lower in some families, and the risk may be higher in others. And when you add it all together, what you get is 15%. Does that make sense to everyone? So the problem we have is we can say what the risk is on average, but we have real trouble. We can't predict what it is at the individual level. And we're trying to think of ways that we could extend the study so that we could provide more specific data to families, because obviously families would like to know what their risk is rather than the average risk. Um, again, our male to female ratio is higher for, for boys, one female to almost three boys. But it's probably not, the difference isn't probably as big as we see with older children. In older children, typically the risk is one, I mean, the ratio is one female to three or four males. So it looks as if we have more females. And I think we do. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but for years people have been saying that it's less likely that little girls will have autism, but when they have it, they're hit really hard, and they have it really severely. And what our data are showing is we don't have any sex difference in terms of severity of autism or severity of mental handicap. So obviously, we're identifying some high-functioning girls, some girls that are more verbal, um, and are probably generally, like cognitively, um, higher functioning that aren't necessarily picked up um, in the general population. And that's something we could talk about. I think a lot of those little girls aren't picked up or they're diagnosed with things like nonverbal learning disability or semantic learning disability. Um, or just diagnose probably some of them with ADHD. Um, but this is interesting. And either it's clear in our data what's going on. You know, in our data, the little girls aren't more severely impaired. They look like the little boys in terms of you having the same distribution you see in the boys. Now, the other thing I want to mention is that it, on top of the 15% of children, babies, who have autism, another 10% have language delays. Okay, now, again, it's early days. We don't know how stable those language delays will be. I mean, in some cases, they may just resolve themselves. But obviously, as we follow the kitties until they're older, we'll have a better sense of, in a sense, how, how stable and significant those language delays are. The other thing I should mention that I haven't mentioned here, so these are kitties who are not diagnosed with autism, but they are SIBs, that is, they have a brother or sister with autism. The other thing I should mention is among the non-ASD, the children who aren't diagnosed but are SIBs, we do have some children who have some pretty significant social anxiety. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying it's different than the social anxiety you can see in some children in the general population. But children who have some social anxiety or, or are just a little bit sticky, you know, a little bit on their own routine. So it's just sort of a temperament trait, if you will. Now, this just shows you how well our measure, the Autism Observation Scale for Infants, distinguishes the babies 
who subsequently are diagnosed with autism. So these are the children at 36 months. The, ch the children uh, in red are the ones that were diagnosed with autism at 36 months. These are the children who are SIBs, but they were not diagnosed with autism. And these are our low-risk control babies. And as you'll see, there's no difference between them at six months, but by 12 months, there's a striking difference. And the same is the case at 18 months. Now again, just keep in mind those are average data because wait until you see this. Okay, these are the babies who got a diagnosis of autism at 36 months. These are the babies who got a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder but did not meet full criteria for autism. Is everyone with me? Okay, so these are the more severely affected babies by, uh, with autism. And these babies did end up getting a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder, but they're not as severely affected with autism. And then the baby sibs who didn't get a, di didn't get a diagnosis and the controls. The message is that we're good at identifying children with ASD. And for those of you who are familiar with these terms, we have very high specificity. When a child gets a high score on our scale, they have autism or ASD. The problem is we miss children. And of course, the children we miss, as I'm sure comes as no surprise to you, are the children who are less severely affected by autism. And I don't know if you're aware of that, but even the scales that were developed for 18-month-olds and 24-month-olds miss the children who are less affected. So it's no surprise when we're using a scale on 12-month-olds and 18-month-olds that we're missing them too. Probably one of the main stories from our data is there's huge differences in these babies who end up being diagnosed with ASD or autism. There's huge differences in how severe the symptoms are. There's huge differences in when, how early they emerge. Um, and there's differences in the nature of the symptoms. Um, so we can identify some kitties as early as 12 to 18 months. Others, the signs don't be, start becoming evident until 18 months, and then we're less likely to be absolutely confident until two years of age, and in some cases, even three years of age. And as I'm sure that comes as no surprise to you, the kitties who are more severely affected, we can pick up earlier. The kitties who are less severely affected later. I want to show you some more data and let me first tell you a bit about the children's early cognitive development and their early development of communication skills. The babies, I'm going to call them the sibs. Just when, you, when I say the sibs, you know I'm talking about the babies who have a brother or sister with autism. The sibs who are diagnosed with autism at 36 months, on average, are a bit delayed by 12 months of age and already show some signs of delayed communication skills. Even before babies can talk, they use gestures. And the babies who subsequently are diagnosed with autism are less likely to use gestures at 12 months. So they're less likely to point, they're less likely to use their eyes to tell people what they want. Um, they're le they typically have some difficulty learning to clap. Um, you know, lots of, not lots, but there certainly are a number of children with autism. When they start to wave, they wave like this instead of like this. Of course, this is what they see, right? Someone waving them, and so they start waving like this rather than like that. Um, but again, even though on average, by 12 months of age, these babies are showing signs of being delayed, there's huge differences. Some of them are delayed, and some of them aren't delayed at all. 
uh, in any significant way. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to, because this is quite staggering, uh, in fact, it's really quite sad what happens to a number of babies. And I, I, here I'm just showing you the first nine babies in our study that were diagnosed with autism. And what I want to point out is number... I want to point out the fact that most babies at 12 months had close to average or average IQs. Okay, obviously this little one, 100 is average. And in fact, anywhere from 85 up is considered very average. And so most of the babies had either close to 85 or 85 and above. I mean, obviously there's a couple that were a little lower. But what's striking is what happens between 12 months and 24 months to a subset of the babies. So this baby's IQ went from 68 to less than 50. This little one's, this one's, we couldn't get it at 12 months. Uh, this little one went from 93 down to 50. Again, 88 down to 50. 82 down to 50. So we have, and then this little one, it didn't fall really until 36 months. But what we have is a subgroup of babies, and it's just really striking, where you see just this striking plateau in their development between 12 and 24 months. Now, I think most of it happens actually between 12 and 18 months. It just so happens we weren't giving an IQ test at 18 months, uh, but we're trying to look at that more carefully. So what I want to point out, I mean, now we have way more babies. We have, you know, up to 45. We have 45 who have been diagnosed, and 20% of the f babies are showing this striking plateau in cognitive development. Now, this is something that needs to be understood because something is happening to those babies between 12 and 18 months. Uh, and, of course, that's when we're starting to really see the symptoms as well. And that doesn't seem to be related to sex at all. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit about temperament. We're now start, we're studying temperament in these babies. And what do we mean by temperament? Well, sort of, are there certain dimensions of temperament, like how you attend to things, how you react to things, what your emotional makeup's like, whether you have, what's your activity level like? I mean, all of us have temperaments, right? I mean, we sort of talk about it in terms of personality, like, oh, he's a really relaxed guy, or she's a really, you know, uptight woman. I mean, these kinds of things to describe temperament. Well, we're interested in trying to understand temperament better in children who have autism. And the reason we're interested in this, and I mean, again, I know I'm not telling you anything. I mean, obviously, a person's more than their autism. And we know that there are kitties with autism who end up coping surprisingly well and other kitties who have more difficulty coping. And we think that part of this may just be related to your temperament or, or personality characteristics that are sort of above and beyond autism. Um, we're also interested in whether temperament helps distinguish the kitties who develop autism, whether it actually predicts diagnosis above and beyond symptoms and IQ, etc. And are there temperamental differences among those who are identified with autism? And, you know, for today, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just let me tell you, when we look at our, our temperament data are based on parent questionnaires. And there's really just a couple of messages I want to leave you with. Um, We've basically found that there's two major temperament factors, or like big dimensions. And one of them is what I'm going to call social approach. 
And what that refers to is the tendency to approach people, to be interested in people, um, the tendency to be engaged by other people. <clears throat> um, and, and that just so happens to go along with being able to shift attention, i.e. when someone calls your name, you, you respond to them calling your name. And it's also related to activity level. So that's one factor. And what we find is that children with autism as a group don't show. They're low on social approach. They're low on social approach and they're high on activity level. They sort of, it's like some of their behavior seems not particularly purposeful and certainly not as oriented to people. And then the other big dimension that comes up is what I'm going to call effortful emotion regulation. And the reason I'm ca we're calling it that is because this particular dimension of temperament refers to emotions. How much anger you show, how easy it is to soothe you, how much fear you show, uh, pleasure, and whether, sort of what your tension's like, whether you can focus attention, um, again, shifting, and inhibit things that you want. And let me tell you what's interesting about these two dimensions is the social approach or behavior approach, just the children who are diagnosed with autism are very low on social approach. And they differ from both the SIBs who aren't diagnosed with autism and controls. But what's interesting when it comes to effortful emotion, like having high anger, high fear, low pleasure, and difficulty sustaining attention, that actually you see in both the SIBs who are diagnosed with autism and in the SIBs who aren't diagnosed. And they both differ um, from the control babies. So this seems to be a trait that doesn't just occur in the SIBs with autism, it also occurs in the SIBs who aren't diagnosed with autism. So this is something we want to understand better. The social approach is really important. The most severely affected babies are very, very low on social approach. Um, and that we want to understand better. So the babies who are really low on social approach were diagnosed earlier, the symptoms were present earlier, and the symptoms are more severe. And those babies are really low on social approach. And one of the things that's important here is we know that there are certain pathways in the brain, they're dopamine pathways, pathways that have been implicated in depression, for example, we know that those ascending pathways, those pathways that come from the very sort of earliest developing parts of the brain um, are related to social approach. Um, and obviously uh, that's something that we want to understand better. Whereas the attention and, and emotion um, dimension that's really got more to do with higher level parts of the brain rather than sort of earlier developing parts of the brain. Now let me just show you this because this is interesting. These are the temperament data at 12 months. Okay? Now just remember, parents are filling out questionnaires. At that point, virtually none of them knew whether their baby had autism, just like we didn't know. And what's interesting is even at 12 months, these two factors come up, okay? Low smiling, high fixation on visual stimuli, and very high activity distinguishes the babies who at 36 months are diagnosed with autism. Difficulty high fear, high distress, and difficulty soothing the babies 
those factors, like effortful control, distinguish both the babies who are subsequently diagnosed with autism and the ones who aren't from the control babies who show low fear and low distress. And one of the things I want to share with you that we want to study further, there's one dimension in six-month-olds that distinguishes the babies actually who are developed with autism. And, and this is as identified by parents long before they know whether their child has autism or not. And the parents describe the babies as fearful at six months. Uh, and this is very important and something we want to understand better. And what the parents are saying are things like, and I mean, they think the baby's fine, but they describe the baby as fearful. And what they say is, you know, he just doesn't want to go to other people. And he sort of gets upset when we go to new places. And obviously, I mean, we know that, you know, that's not unusual in babies. But what these parents are saying is, it's much more so with my baby. It's really striking. Now, that is quite striking, to think they're picking up that fear in their babies as early as six months of age. Now I, I want to just share with you some data on attention, and I'm going to go very quickly because I want to talk about treatment too. Um, but just let me tell you, we've been studying what's called visual spatial attention. Now this brings us back to disengagement. This form of attention refers to the ability to, I mean really, to engage on something like I'm engaging on Brian's face, than to disengage from it and move my attention elsewhere. And this, this system allows us to make quick shifts in attention. And I mean, just think how we have to be able to do this. I mean, you're crossing the street and a car comes along. You may be paying attention to someone that you're interested in seeing over there, but you have to quickly shift your attention and respond to that car, right, to make sure that you're safe. So we're very good at doing this, and presumably it has tremendous survival value. Well, it's very interesting. We understand this form of attention in normal babies. Early on, when babies are one month of age, their attention's all over the place. By two months, they can engage their intention on specific things. So they can start focusing, like on your face. But at that age, they have trouble disengaging. So their attention is sticky. It's referred to as obligatory. But by three or four months, well, four months really, babies not only can fixate, they can also disengage their attention and move it elsewhere. And what's really interesting is parents describe how at around four or five months, they're much it's much easier to soothe their baby, distract them and soothe them. Well, it's probably related to development of this mechanism. Um, anyway, we've been studying this in autism on the assumption that babies, that children with autism have difficulty. And in fact, one of my students read, previous students, Reg Landry, who is a clinical psychologist in Cape Breton, did his PhD dissertation on this and showed that children with autism have difficulty disengaging attention. And another student showed that they have particular difficulty disengaging and shifting attention to the left side of space, uh, which we, is interesting. Anyway, let me show you our task. It's really easy. The baby just comes into a room with a screen and sits on his mother's or father's lap and the room's darkened a bit, and this one stimulus comes on. Now, in reality, it's really bright, and it moves. And once the baby's attention is engaged on that stimulus, a second stimulus appears either to the left or the right, and we measure the time it takes for the baby to make an eye movement to the new stimulus. Is that clear to everyone? Now, the critical manipulation is whether the central one goes off or not. When it goes off, it's a shift trial. When it stays on, it's a disengage trial because the child has to disengage and shift. And what we find is children with autism have trouble on the disengage trials. They get stuck. 
I mean, we actually have videos of little boys. I mean, there's, there's two striking ones where the second stimulus comes on, like over here, and the little boy's neck moves, but he can't get his eyes unstuck from the center stimulus. Needless to say, that can be distressing for the children, too. I mean, sometimes it isn't. They're just absorbed and they like what they're doing. But sometimes it's distressing if they want to move their attention. We had one little boy where he was looking and then, sorry, it came on on this side. And he actually went like this and looked at it out of peripheral vision. Um, and, you know, we've noticed things like rapid breathing and, and signs of distress when they have difficulty disengaging. So one of the questions we were interested in is whether difficulty disengaging would distinguish the babies who subsequently are diagnosed with autism. And you'll see at six months, it doesn't. These are the babies who were subsequently diagnosed with autism. These are the babies who weren't, and these are the low-risk controls. However, by 12 months of age, these are the 12-month data, there's a clear difference. And the babies who were diagnosed at 36 months, when you look and see what happened to them at 12 months, they had difficulty disengaging attention, and particularly, obviously, strikingly difficulty disengaging and shifting attention to the left side of space. Now, why would they have difficulty shifting and disengaging to the left side? Well, the left side of space is controlled by the right hemisphere. And we know that the right hemisphere is really important for emotion. So one of the questions we asked is whether this disengage problem at 12 months is related to difficulty regulating emotion. Now, why would we ask that? People who are experts on this, on temperament, have argued that one of the most important functions of the disengage mechanism is that it allows us to regulate our emotion. And if you think about it, when we're really upset, what we do is distract ourselves. We disengage from what's bothering us, and we do something else. So, to try and regulate our emotions. Right? I can remember one day getting a big ticket downtown, and I couldn't get home fast enough. I was so upset, I just wanted to get out in my garden and forget that it even happened. Right? I just wanted to distract myself. Well, let me show you that longer disengaged reaction times on the left side in children distinguishes the babies who went on to develop ASD, and that difficulty disengaging is associated with parents' reports at the same age, at 12 months of age, of increased irritability, less reactivity to environmental events, and difficulty soothing the babies. Presumably, it was difficult to distract them. So we think this difficulty disengaging to the left is related to some disruption with right hemisphere functioning, which is heavily Im involved in emotion and its regulation. Now, next steps. The critical thing is, now, is developing an intervention for even younger babies. And we've just been funded by Autism Speaks, the big US private funding agency, to start developing and evaluating an intervention for babies. And this will be for 12 to 24 month old babies in whom we see really, you know, high evidence of autism. That is very, you know, strong signs of autism. And this is going to be a parent mediated intervention and we're pretty well ready to start now. We've been working on it for about a year. And we've actually piloted two families in Halifax and two families in Toronto. And the intervention is based on pivotal response treatment. 
It's not entirely all pivotal response treatment, but it's very based on pivotal response treatment. <clears throat> and I'm, the parents are learning it, and they're just doing a fabulous job. Um, and you probably know that pivotal response treatment is the foundation for the Nova Scotia Early Intervention, Early Intensive Intervention Program. And I'm certainly happy to talk about that. With the babies, our two main targets, like what, you know, you've got to decide what you're going to target, right? You can't do everything. Uh, and we know, well, we want to target what we think is the most important things to target to really help the babies get on a better pathway. So we're targeting communication, verbal and nonverbal, and the sharing of positive affect. Now, why are we targeting sharing of positive affect? There's now all kinds of data showing that babies and children learn better when they're happy. Positive affect is associated with earlier language development, earlier development of joint attention. So we're really trying to increase the probability that these babies are happy, that they're smiling, and we want to help them learn how to share affect with other people so that other people become associated with something positive for them. And finally, because when babies are happy, they're more likely to learn. Um, now, the other thing I want to mention to you, just because, you know, I assume a lot of you are interested in treatment. The other thing I just want to mention is, you know, there are ways in which we would like to expand what we're currently doing in the early intervention program for preschoolers too. And one of the things I'm happy to talk about tonight, what a group of us would like to start working on is really focusing on the kiddies who are making less progress in intervention. You may know the data on our provincial intervention program are very encouraging. On average, the children are making huge gains. But again, there's variability. Some of the kiddies are really making huge gains. Some of them are making great gains. They may not be quite as huge, but they're still great. And then we have a small subgroup of babies who aren't making as much progress as we would hope. Um, and that's a group we want to start focusing on and really try and make sure that we're doing the very best we can for those children. And so I'm happy to talk about that because um, uh, we've been working on a big grant proposal to try and focus exclusively on those children. Uh, and that's a big project and that's a really important project. And finally, I'll just make a few obvious, a few concluding comments. Obviously, ASD is evident by 12 to 18 months in many children, but certainly not all. Um, it's associated with a certain style of temperament. And in a particular subgroup, it's associated with a real decrement or plateau in cognitive development that we need to understand better. This is really important. Um, obviously, we have higher co-occurrence rates than we had anticipated. Obviously, these data raise questions about whether we should be screening children for developmental delays and for autism. And that's a really sort of tricky issue, but I know there's lots of people in Nova Scotia who are really interested in that. It's a tricky issue because we're limited in terms of how good our screening instruments are. And finally, obviously, it's really important to extend intervention, to sort of try and do a better job for all the kids um, and to start thinking about how we can extend it beyond sort of down to littler ones and up for children who are moving out of, um, into sort of school age and beyond. So I'll just end by thanking you, by thanking all the families that have contributed so much, our funders, Hospital for Sick Children Foundation, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and Autism Speaks, and my colleagues. And thank you. <laughs>